weeks ago, we kicked off a series of messages called The Second Mile. It's our theme this year in the high school ministry. And we're going off of Jesus' teachings in Matthew chapter 5 in the great Sermon on the Mount where he teaches his disciples this, that if a man compels you to go one mile, go with him too. That even in a culture that offends you, a culture that goes against every entitlement you have as a citizen, a culture that rubs against your selfishness. Jesus says, even in the midst of that culture, I want you to learn how to go the second mile with people that you don't necessarily like or even love. I want you to go the second mile. And so for the past few weeks, we've been asking this question, is what does the second mile look like? And and honestly, Jesus not only lived out the second mile, he modeled that. He's the example of that. In fact, man, he is that, the second mile. But tonight, the question narrows down to this. What is the chief end of the second mile? Like, what's on the other end of that rainbow once we get there? What is our hope? What is our passion? If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 5. And as you turn there, let's look starting in verse 43. Now listen, this message I preach tonight is counterculture in that it's going to kind of rock the way we're so easily offended. It's going to kind of change the way that if we're not careful, we feel entitled. In fact, this message is really going to scream out against any selfishness within our hearts and in our lives. I believe that's why Jesus preached it. He knew it was to the glory of God and to our good. Listen to what it says here in verse 43 of Matthew chapter 5. You have heard it said, this is Jesus speaking, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Did not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Let's pray together, and we'll finish out our series on the second mile. Father, honor the reading of your word. Be glorified in the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So what is the end of the second mile? Listen, the end of the second mile can be found most clearly in the way that you and I love our enemies. And so tonight as we look at Matthew chapter 5, I want to give you three final challenges in the second mile. Three final challenges from Jesus' sermon when it comes to the second mile. First of all, write this down if you got a way to take notes. There is no room for hatred in the second mile. Hey, hey, believer, Christ follower, there is absolutely no room for hatred in the second mile. Look at verse 43. You've heard it said, Jesus said, love your neighbors and hate your enemy, right? You have heard it said. But I tell you, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. Listen, nowhere in Scripture are you going to find where we are commanded to hate anybody. Like, you're you're not going to go find that golden Scripture that allows you to hate on anybody. What Jesus is saying when it says you have heard it said is that the Bible says love your neighbor. But the teachers, the Pharisees, the religious people of our day, And they're throwing their own twist into things. And so, although it's not commanded in the Bible to love your neighbor and hate your enemy, it is what's being practiced in that day. They take passages of Scripture, like we find in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Listen to this. Where God says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord your God. So what they would do, the religious leaders would take this passage of Scripture and use it as justification to love their own and to hate anybody who's not like them, who doesn't believe like them. And although that's not in Scripture to hate others, it was what was being practiced when Jesus was preaching his message. And Jesus draws attention to this. And you know what? Here's here's what I begin to see. You and I have absolutely no right. You and I have absolutely no freedom to. 
And there is absolutely no room in the second mile for you and I to hate anybody. We're not justified by the way somebody acts towards us. We're not justified in what somebody does to us. We're not justified because somebody believes differently than us to then exact hatred upon them. Well, you say, well, Anthony, what is, what is hatred then? L- listen to me, a hatred, you know what it is. It is a deep dislike, disdain, a deep disrespect for someone to the point to where you long for, look for, and even pray for their demise, their destruction. Literally, it is, it is disliking somebody to the point where you hope they're harmed or they're hurt. It is that deep of a desire. It's not just disagreeing with somebody. It is literally a hatred for who they are. Martin Luther King Jr. said this in one of his messages. He said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So you want to know a countercultural way to love and to serve is how are we going to treat those we consider as enemies to us? And Jesus emphatically states, you and I, there's, listen, there's no room in the second mile for hatred. And I wrote this down. We cannot hate because of color. We cannot hate because of race. We cannot hate because of religion. We can't even hate because of sexual orientation. We cannot hate because of political affiliation. We cannot hate those who insult us. We cannot hate those who do not like us. We cannot hate those who persecute us. We cannot hate those who hate us. There is absolutely no room given by our Lord to hate anyone for anything. And yet, We live in a culture that hates so much that something as small as politics can bring hatred. Something as small as a tweet can bring hatred. And something as small as a glance looking at the wrong person, it can bring hatred. I love this statement, and I've said this so many times throughout the years. I love this old saying, that I'm just nobody trying to tell everybody about a somebody who could save anybody. Isn't that good? You see, even a statement like that gets to the heart of what Jesus is preaching. And that is, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. And I'm telling you, man, you got to love your enemies. you got to pray for those who persecute you. Jesus revolutionizes it. Listen, any hatred in your heart and my heart towards anybody, any group of people, must be turned into hope. The type of hope that proclaims that Jesus loves everybody and can save anybody. When Jesus is the object of our affection, people become the object of our attention. And their salvation, no matter who they are, becomes our objective, our call to action. In verse 43, Jesus says to love your neighbor. That word neighbor is pretty unique because if you're not careful, you're like, okay, that's good because I only got one neighbor and they're not weird and so I'm going to love them and therefore I have fulfilled the law of Christ. But you know what that word really means? In Greek, the word neighbor simply means the near one. The one nearest you. The one closest in proximity to you at any given moment, this word can encompass. So it's not just the person living next door. It's not when you go to college, it's the person in the dorm next door. It literally is anybody that you are in close proximity to. It could be physically, it could be online, it could be social media, it could be through text. Listen, anybody that you have any type of influence around can be your neighbor. And so we, we don't need to play this word game. Well, neighbor is next door, and so I can hate some people and love us. A neighbor is that neighbor who's in front of you at the moment, who's under your influence at the moment, who's within earshot of you at just that moment. Let's go back to the march, if you would. Hey, Logan, try to show the first picture that, um, of the group praying together. Can you do that? No, nope, one more over because I want to come back to this picture. Here's, here's the picture of us together as a group. 
And uh, finally, everybody started showing up at 1130, right? So it wasn't me and just the women who weren't really with me. It was a bunch of us and hundreds of us. And I want to go ahead and show you the pictures around. So go back to the signs picture that we just saw. This was all around us. And these were just the signs that I could show you tonight. Um, there were dozens of women and even men there who at times would shout terrible things about Jesus. If any woman showed up, they would shout terrible things about that woman and really relate to the fact that she's not a woman. And so I'm watching all this. I am stepped back and I'm praying and I'm worshiping the Lord because we're worshiping downtown Charlotte and we're hearing all these people scream with us. And just a few minutes in, there was this kind of little confrontation over here as, as one of the abortion activists come up in the middle of us and start swinging elbows. And I mean, it's just, it was crazy. And then the leader of the march comes up to me and says, hey, Anthony, will you come up and will you pray as we kick off the march? I'm like, this is, I've been praying in my prayer journal, um, Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. I'm just asking God, even outside the context of being your youth pastor, God, would you give me opportunities to share and be the gospel outside the norm? And so here I was, I never told them I was going, I just was in the background and they came up and asked me to pray and to kick off this march. And I was like, this is awesome. And then it hit me. I am going to become a target. Like, I'm going to have to be escorted back to my car because I'm a big guy, but there's a lot of them. I thought, man, and all of a sudden I was like, you know, it's okay. I get up there and I pray, listen, I pray the very heart of this message. Pray not to condemn, but to give life and get done. We start the march. And I walk by some of the protesters. And the things they said about me, my mom, <laughs> by close to me, the Lord I served were terrible. Let me tell you what happened in my heart for just a moment. How dare you? One day, and God broke me. Because you know what I was surrounded by? I was surrounded by a whole bunch of people who'd been deceived who bought into a lie. In my prayer, I said, Father, I am a father of women. I married a woman. I've been raised by a woman. I was birthed in this world by a woman. I may not be a woman, but listen, I love the women God has brought in my life. Every bit of my paycheck goes to women, to their health, to their well-being, to their happiness. Every bit, and guys, if you're dating, you know that too, right? Like every bit of the $3 you earn is going towards her. Every bit of what you have. And when I prayed that, and they went after me. And I remember catching myself, of God breaking me of how I was seeing the people who were my enemies. And literally he broke my heart so much so that instead of being angry, my enemies, and I just began to pray for them become broken hearted for them. No matter what they said, no matter the depravity, the profanity, the godlessness that I saw, my heart was broken for their lostness. And you know what? So your youth pastor this week is preaching what he practiced. You hear practice what you preach, but really we ought to, we ought to preach what we practice. And God taught me what it is to love even those who would set themselves up as my enemies. To see them as Jesus sees them. I had to love my enemies in hopes to point them to the love of my Father. And I pray I did that this past week. I remember hearing the story about a young salesman who was very disappointed about losing a big sale. Listen, if you work in sales, and some of you will, man, if you miss a big sale, a big paycheck coming in, you're going to be disappointed. Well, he is disappointed. And he talked with his sales manager, and he lamented. He says, I guess it proves that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Talking about his sales pitch. 
And the manager replied this, your job is not to make the horse drink. Your job is to make him thirsty. Hey guys, listen to me. When Jesus calls us in this passage to love our enemies, the chief end of going the second mile loving our enemies is to make them thirsty for the love we are loving them with. It's to make them thirsty for the one who loved us enough to allow us to love even our enemies. And so when I stood out there that day and I began to pray and I began to point people to Jesus and I didn't respond to the hateful and terrible things that were said to me that day. In fact, in my prayer, I prayed for them. Man, my prayer is what made some of them thirsty. Thirsty for Jesus. The source, 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. That is how we make people thirsty for the gospel. And so the challenge, there is no room for hate, listen to me, in the second mile. When our hate turns to hope in Christ, our love makes people thirsty for Jesus. And let me ask you this question. Does your love of people make people thirsty? For Jesus. Hey, let me ask you this. Think of your enemies in your mind. Some of you, you believe your enemy is your parents. May God help us. Some of you think your enemy is your sibling. Man, you don't know much about life. Some of you think your enemy is authority figures in your life. Man, little do you know. Some of you think that your enemy lies in your classroom. Whoever your enemy is. Your Jesus, who loves you, is calling on you to love them. To go the second mile in loving them and make them thirsty. And here's where we close tonight. Just as there is no room for hate in the second mile, there's every reason to love in the second mile. Verse 45, here's reason number one. God loves our enemies. Listen, God loves people. Look at what it says here in verse 45. And God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. You know what's amazing about this passage? What is saying this? It's pointing us back to the fact that God loves people. And God provides people. Those who are his, those who are not. Those who are good because of Jesus and those who are evil. God loves people. God loves humanity. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Reason number one is because God loves our enemies. And God loves people. You know, sometimes when we get so mad at somebody, we're like, God, I wish you'd just destroy every evil person on the face of the earth. And then his spirit quickly reminds us that we're done for as well. Thank God that he loves people. Reason number two is when we love people, it points them to the love of our Father. I love verses 46 and 47. If you love those who love you, what reward would you get? Are not even the tax collector. Listen, this is Jesus, shots across the bow at the Pharisees, right? This is Jesus, mic drop against the Pharisees. He's saying, you think you're something by loving those who love you? Even tax collectors do that. Even IRS agents do that. Even the lowest of the low do that. He goes on and says this, and if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't even pagans do that? And listen to me, you always saying, it is nothing for people to love people who love them. It is nothing for people to be kind to people who are kind to them. What Jesus is saying, the type of love I have is the type of love that says, though you are my greatest enemy, though you may persecute me, though you may insult me, though you may try to hurt me, man, I'm going to love you because God loves me. I mean, that's what he's called me to do. And that's the type of love, the second mile love he calls us to. Jesus calls us to love our neighbors, the ones near us in proximity. Some time ago, an 18-year-old girl, and I've got to end here because our time is up. An 18-year-old girl from Washington State University attended a worship service. For the first time in her life, she heard the gospel shared. For the first time in her life, She heard the gospel. The following Tuesday, one of the members of the church that she knew received a letter 
from her. And here's her, here's her letter, an 18-year-old girl. Last Sunday, I attended your church, and I heard the preacher. In the sermon, the preacher said that all men have sinned and rebelled against God because of their, um, because of their rebellion and disobedience. They all face eternal damnation and separation from God. But then he also said that God loves men and sent his son Jesus Christ in the world to redeem men from their sins and that all those who believe in him would go to heaven and live with God eternally, right? He must have preached a good message because she heard it. My parents recently died really close to each other. She goes on to write, I know they did not believe in Jesus Christ, whom you call the Savior of the world. Listen to what she says. If what you believe is true, my mom and dad are damned. You compel me to believe that either you yourself don't really believe this message or that you don't care at all. And she closes with this sentence. You see, we live only three blocks down from your church and no one's ever told us. No one's ever told us. Let me ask you something. Your neighbor, the person who sits next to you in class, your neighbor, the person you sports with and life with, your neighbor next door to your house, the neighbor you sit on the bus with, the person you come in contact with the hall, if they were to write you a letter knowing the gospel, number one, would they be surprised you're a Christian? And number two, would they question whether you really believe their message or that you don't care? I'm not even talking the enemy. I'm talking about your neighbors. Do you even care? And so what's the end of the second mile? And, and I've got to skip so much tonight just because we're behind on time. And so what's the end of the gospel? I can make you feel guilty, right? That letter is like a kick in the gut. Like, man, I feel bad, and that will never motivate you to do anything. But Jesus' message, because you see, when Jesus says to love your enemies, there was a time he was on the cross, and those who had crucified him and were seen to it that he was crucified, he cried out for them, Father, forgive them, for they know not what to do. L listen to what Scripture says about us. You ready? That once you and I were alienated from God and were enemies in our minds because of our evil behaviors from Him. So when Jesus says, love your enemies, He is pre preaching what He's practiced. And that very love cost Him His life on the cross for you and for me. And it would be upon that cross that Jesus with His life would scream, I love my enemies. I love you. And it would be at the resurrection that Jesus was given power to not only love his enemies, but to save us. Let that be the very motivation behind why you and I, as we go the second mile, this counterculture way to love and to serve, recognize that all our love and all of our service end in the gospel and watching Jesus transform lives. When you and I step up to the plate and we begin to share the gospel around your tables tonight, you probably saw them. There are packets of papers. In it is about 30 years of gospel presentations that have been given. And you know what's amazing what I told one life group? That's not the problem. The problem isn't that we don't know the right way to share the gospel. That's not the problem. I will go home in just a few minutes before I head back to the hospital. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take two books that I have memorized. Zoo's Who's and Winnie the Pooh's Nighttime Songs, right? And I'm going to sing to my daughters as they hold the books. And I know every page, every word, and every animal in succession of when they're going to come up. I'm 34 I'm a father to three beautiful girls. I'm a full-time youth pastor, and I'm telling you, I can memorize children books. So the problem isn't you and me memorizing stuff. The problem with sharing the gospel is a problem of the heart. We have no motivation because we, we fail to obey the words of Jesus. To love, can I ask you something? 
How much do you have to hate someone not to share the gospel with them? How much do you have to hate somebody not to share the gospel with them? So back at the march, in my prayer time, I talked about how we were all broken and said, Father, the truth is, is that we are all broken here. We have broken stories, broken testimonies, broken lives. And we understand the truth of the gospel. Jesus died for our sins. He rose again because he alone can mend the brokenness. He alone can heal the hurting. Because you know what? No matter what those people said to me or about me or about Jesus, I didn't hate them enough to not at least point them and share the gospel. In just a few minutes, I'm going to go home and I'm going to tuck my girls in. I'm going to go back to the hospital where I've been all day. A friend of mine, Ryan Parker, his two kids just came through the high school ministry. He's breathing his last breaths of life on this earth. He is eaten up with cancer. And I've been by his bedside this afternoon, holding his hand, crying with him as he speaks his last words to his family, to his children who are still teenagers. And one of the most amazing moments today is he took my hand and Pastor Lance's hand and said, guys, I want you to do my, I want you to do my service. And he's weeping today. He's weeping. He says, he says, guys, I don't know how you do a funeral service because you just, but you just do it so people can say it. If my kids are in my life, then somebody can get saved. And that makes it worth it all. And I will go back to the hospital in just a few minutes and hold his hand as cancer steals from him his very last breath. And with his last breath, he is experiencing the love that only Jesus could bring. And that is even in his darkest and most difficult time, all he cares about is that people know Jesus. Let's pray together.